doing, we'll be doing today uh, pretty much the same nucleic acid, you know, which you did last year in your biology. Yeah, it's pretty much the same, except with maybe a few additions here and there, but the same nucleic acids. So the objective of this discussion really is to describe the basic structure, functions, and therapeutic use of nucleic acids in medicine. So remember, we're, we're not biochemists, we're medical doctors. So when they took, uh, looking at this course biochemistry, our main focus is on its application in the medical field. So by the end of this session, you should be able to describe nucleosides, nucleotides, and nucleic acids. You should be able to describe the structure and the properties of purines and pyrimidine bases, explain the use of nucleoside analogs as therapeutics in cancer, HIV, and the genetic makeup, key proteins, and the current therapeutics. So this is what we are trying to achieve at the end of today's session. I hope um, the introduction is well and good and everyone is clear and we can progress. Are we okay to progress? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay, so you did biology. Based on the knowledge in biology, can anyone describe what any what nucleic acids are? I'm sure you, this is one of the first topics you did in biology 1400. Anyone has an idea? So that at least we can be interactive. We we'll discuss here, and the, anyone who can boldly just talk about what nucleic acids are under a minute. These are molecules that contain a nucleotide and a phosphoric plus a phosphoric group. A nucleoside plus a phosphate group. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else? That's a very good attempt. Thank you very much. Anyone else? What are nucleic acids? Nucleic acids are molecules that are made up of nucleotides. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Or we can proceed. Anyone else? I think from what your, your colleagues have mentioned, it's loud and clear. So nucleic acids are bio molecules, the bio, the macromolecules, which are essential in the functioning of the cell. So now, now that you've described the nuclear nucleic acids are, any idea what the functions are of these nucleic acids? functions of nucleic acids because i'm sure there's one major function which you're thinking about you can tell me that's someone you're thinking about the main they function. store genetic information exactly anyone else any other function you know transfer of genetic information okay Thank you. So that's what nucleic acids do basically. It's with our macromolecules in our body, which store genetic information, which is used in the buildup of proteins and can be transferred from one organism to the, the other during the, how when the, the sexual reproduce, this genetic composition is what makes up the cell or the human, if, for example, human being, this genetic material is what makes us who we are. So. This genetic material we have is stored in the nucleic acids. So uh, quickly, what are the compositions? What is the composition of the nucleic acids? Um, it has got a five carbon sugar, a nitrogenous base, and um, a phosphate group. OK, <clears throat> thank you straight to the point so nucleic acids are made up of three components the phosphate group which you already mentioned the ribose sugar which is the five carbon carbohydrate as he mentioned and the nucleic and the nitrogenous base okay so that's the basic introduction on nucleic acids so now like we mentioned so 
uh, we have two the basic units of nucleic acids and nucleotides. So now we have two different things which tend to be confused at times. So we have a nucleoside and a nucleotide. So when we are trying to make up this nucleic acids, the first thing we do is attach our nitrogenous base to our pentose sugar. In this case, depending on the type of genetic material, it can be RNA or DNA, but it's a ribose sugar, which is a pentose, a five carbon sugar. So when you have a makeup of a nitrogenous base and the pentose, that composition is called a nucleoside. So emphasis on the S, it's called a nucleoside. Then if you have, when you, now when you attach the phosphate group to these two pentose and the nitrogenous base, it becomes a nucleoside. So you have nucleotide, sorry. We have a nucleoside and a nucleotide. Now of these two, now, so there are the two categories basically we have of the nucleoside and the nucleotide. Now, this nucleic acid, the genetic material we're talking about, can be of two categories. It can either be RNA, which is ribonucleic acid, or DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid. So these are the two um, nucleic acids we'll be mainly concentrating on. So now, when you look at RNA, so these are some, when you look at uh, my screen here to the left, we have these strands. We have this RNA here and we have this DNA here. Of course, you know that RNA is single-stranded, meaning it's only one strand. Whereas DNA is double-stranded, as you can see here, it's paired, two different strands are paired together. And in the progressing, as we go on this discussion, we're able to see how the pairing happens, the type of bonds present there, and whatnot. So that's the RNA and the DNA. Okay. So this is the nucleotide structure, which I mentioned earlier on. We have a sugar here, which can be, which is the pentose. We have a phosphate group and a nitrogenous base. So we'll, we'll, we'll go through all these things detail in detail and you'll be able to appreciate them better. So uh, we'll start with the nitrogenous bases. So Nitrogenous bases can be classified in uh, two categories. They can either be a purine or pyridine. So there are two categories, nitrogenous bases. So, uh, purines are a combination of a pyrimidine ring and a five-membered imidazole ring. So you, when, you, when you go to the next slide, I'm sure you'll be able to see this more clearly. You find that a, a pyrimidine, ha, purines have double rings whereas pyrimidines are simply six-membered hydrocyclic aromatic rings, just simply aromatic rings which contain two nitrogen atoms. So both purines and pyrimidines are relatively insoluble in water. So emphasis, purines and pyrimidines are insoluble in water. So take note of that one. So these are the nitrogenous bases I was talking about. So uh, when you look at this diagram here, this diagram is basically just giving us the examples of the nitrogenous bases. So the first one we have here is a purine. So a purine, like I said, it's bicyclic. It's got two rings joined together. Of course, there's one a six-membered ring and a five-membered ring. So the counting begins from here. We have one, two, three, four, five. Pyrimidine portion one and portion three are replaced by nitrogen. So as you do your organic chemistry, I'm sure you know whenever there's a turn, like an example on carbon number six, you know, of course, that there's a hydrogen atom there. So most of these things are implied. So whenever you just see a turn of this nature, so when you do this in your um, organic chemistry, it will make much more sense. But when you see a turn of this nature, just know there's a hydrogen atom there, a hydrogen, a hydrogen, there's no hydrogen here because remember nitrogen can only make a maximum of three bonds. So there's no nitrogen there. Of course, this corner here when there's nothing implies that there is a carbon atom. So there's a carbon atom here, a carbon atom here, a carbon atom here, and equally a carbon atom here. So remember, for carbon to be stable, it's supposed to make four bonds. So if you count the bonds here, there's one, two, three, and there's a fourth bond, 
with a hydrogen. So these are the basic structures of the purines and the pyrimidines. Now, when you come to the purines, there are two types of purines. We have the aldenine, aldenine and the guanine. So, um, so the, the basic structure of these rings is pretty much the same. They're both bicyclic. Now, the only minor differences that come in is when you look at carbon number six on the adenine, we have an amine group. So that's how you're able to identify that this is an amine because of the presence of the, uh, sorry, adenine because of the presence of an amine group at carbon six. When you look at guanine, guanine is equally bicyclic and you look at the position of carbon number two and equally carbon number six. If I'm in carbon number two, we equally have an amine group, except in adenine, the carb amine group is on carbon six. But in, gua in guanine, guanine, the carbon atom is the amine atom, sorry, the amine group is in carbon number two. Then equally have an oxygen atom attached at carbon six. So this is the structure, basic structure of the adenine and the guanosine. Same applies the, the mono, monocyclic structures, which are the pyrimidines. They all have the same structure. The only differ in the functional groups they have. Of course, with cytosine having the amine group and oxygen atom there, we have uracil with two oxygen groups. Same with the thiamine, except it equally has a methyl group. So under normal circumstances, you will never be asked to actually draw the structures of these. But the important things you have to note is that, of course, we have DNA and RNA. So uh, both purines are present in both DNA and RNA. Both guanine and, guanine and adenine are present in DNA. But when it comes to pyrimidines, they are special. Cytosine is present in both DNA and RNA, but the difference comes in that uracil is found in RNA and thymine is found in DNA. So that's the basic structures of the nitrogenous bases when you look at the structures of DNA. So we tackle the nitrogenous bases. Now, uh, when, we, when you did, I'm sure you did your biology 14, 1400, you covered those three, five major nitrogenous bases. We have the pyramid, the pyrimidines, the adenine and the guanine. And we have the pyrimidines, of which the pyrimidines are the cytosine, thymine, thy, thymine and uracil. So now we have additional nitrogenous bases, which you need to know as well. We have the hypoxanthine, we have the xanthine and the uric acid. Now, when you look at these nitrogenous bases, they resemble the structure of pyrimidines, of purines, sorry, they resemble the structure of purines in that they're both bicyclic, all the three here are bicyclic, the hypoxanthine, the xanthine, and the uric acid. So these are the other naturally occurring pyrimidine derivatives. So you, you naturally find them in the body. So the xanthine and the uric acid frequently occur as constituents of urinary tract stones. So for those who may get, who have a urinary tract stone, so that's basically hard masses found in the urinary tract. Xanthine and uric acid frequently occur in those uric stones. Xanthine stones, so they can either be called xanthine stones or urate stones, depending on the component that's present. So if your urinary tract stones contain xanthine, they can be called xanthine stones. If they contain uric acid, they can be called urate stones. These are just the addition nucleotides we will need to know in addition to the already known ones. So, now we'll look at the properties. So, nitrogenous bases have properties. So, we'll look at the basic properties of these nitrogenous bases. So, number one, they undergo ketoeno tautomeric shifts because of the aromaticity of the nitrogenous bases and the electron rich groups of oxygen and nitrogen. The second one is they have strong ultraviolet light 
absorbance due to the aromatic and hydrostatic liquorings. So <clears throat> these nitrogenous bases, when exposed to UV light or to strong ultraviolet light, these uh, nitrogenous bases are able to absorb that strong UV light. So they're also capable of forming hydrogen bonds. So that's how this pyramid, when you look at the DNA structure, I'm sure you see it in the, in the proceedings when they're forming the double helix. This double helix normally is formed due to the hydrogen bonds formed between uh, different pairs of nitrogenous bases. And you see the pairing of we have adenine with thiamine and cytosine with guanine and the, all those different pairings. We'll be able to see them as we look at the base pairing of nitrogenous bases. So now that base pairing occurs due to the ability of them being able to make nitrogenous hydrogen bonds. Yeah. So the other thing is that they're weakly basic comp compounds. So when put in the pH scale, they're weakly basic. Simply means they have a pH of somewhere 14 and the like. So they're weakly basic. Then the other thing I mentioned is that they are hydrophobic and relatively insoluble in water. So they can't dissolve in water and meaning they are hydrophobic. These are some of the structures of the nitrogenous bases. Are there any questions on the nitrogenous bases before you go and start talking about the pentose sugar? There are no questions on the nitrogenous bases. Okay, so we can proceed in that case. The next thing we talk about is the pentose sugar. So the pentose sugar from the name simply means it has five carbon atoms. Now this pentose sugar is present in a cyclic form and it's called a furanose five-membered ring form. So that's the form in which the pentose sugar is. So we have two pentose sugars. They can either be deoxyribose or, or deribose. So when you say the deoxyribose, you simply know that an oxygen atom has been removed from carbon two. The deoxyribose is there to be a constituent for DNA, deoxyribose. There's no oxygen at carbon two. And the deribose is found in RNA. So that's that about the two. Uh, the pentose sugars present in DNA. So we have this structure here. This is the linear form. If you can see where my pointer is, this is the linear form of the D ribose, which is present in DNA. Now, when it's making the, the in RNA, sorry, when you're making the RNA molecule, you find that this D ribose undergoes a folding and forms a cyclic structure, which is a beta B ribofunerous, meaning it forms a ring a ring type of structure, a five carbon member ring. The same with deoxyribose, same component the difference is when you look at carbon two. On the ribulose, ribose, sorry, there's an oxygen, but on the deoxyribose, deox, meaning oxygen has been removed. So that's that on the pentose sugars. Then the next thing you can talk about is the phosphate group. So, the phosphate group will attach to the nitrogenous, to the sugar, so to the pentose. So, in the structure of the phosphate and the sugar will attach both to the pentose, the nitrogenous, and the nitrogenous base will only attach to the phosphate. So, these diagrams here are just showing how the phosphate group attaches to carbon five of the, the, the sugar, the deoxyribose or the ribose, whether it's DNA or RNA, okay? So when the phosphate bond, so when one phosphate binds to a nucleotide, it's called a, a, a monophosphate. So now 
depending on the number of phosphate groups attached to that particular base or the, the pentose, so attached to that pentose sugar, would determine the name of that uh, macromolecule. So we take, for instance, this one. I hope you can see where my pointer is. We have this one here. So now, by looking at this string structure, we can see at position number six, we have the, the amine group. So automatically, you know, the nitrogenous base being talked about here is adenine. So adenine will attach to this pentose sugar by an end glycosidic bond and the phosphate will attach to carbon number five by bond as well. So now this molecule is called adenosine monophosphate. Mono meaning one and the phosphate representing the phosphate group. So that's adenosine monophosphate. When you have two phosphate groups, it becomes adenosine diphosphate. When you have three, it can be adenosine triphosphate. Now, there are times when you have this monophosphate group and it decides to make a ring structure and attach bo to both carbon number five as well as carbon number four. It makes some kind of cyclic structure. This becomes cyclic aden adenosine monophosphate. This is a very important second messenger in biochemistry, physiology, and many other things as you'll be seeing in this, in this second year of ours. So most of these things, you'll be able to see them, the cyclic adenosine monophosphate, the adenosine triphosphate. This is the famous ATP you hear about, which is used to give out energy and whatnot. So that's pretty much on the phosphate groups. So now the structure of the bonds. So now we have phosphodiester bonds. The phosphodiester bonds are the bonds that join the phosphate group to the pentose sugar. We have the phosphodiester bonds. So when you look at them here, we have this bond here between <clears throat> an oxygen and the carbon there. We have this bond here. That's a phosphor for the phosphate ester bond. This is the phosphor ester bond, which joins the phosphate group to the sugar. So when we're talking about the bonds, so you have to make note of two bonds when you talk about the nucleotides, the two bonds in particular. We have the N glycosidic bond, which attaches the nitrogenous base to the pentose sugar. And we have the phosphoester bond that attaches the phosphate group to the pentose sugar as well. These are two bonds mainly you find in nucleosides, nucleotides, sorry. So this is simply showing you. Now, uh, there's another bond which you come across, which is the phosphodiester bond. Now, the phosphodiester bond is this linkage here, which joins two DNA or two RNA molecules. So now, remember, DNA is a long repeating chain. It's a very long chain. So from one nucleotide to the next, they have to be joined. Now, those nucleotides are joined together by the phosphodiester bonds. So they're joined at carbon number five, carbon number three. And when the DNA is growing, the attachment will be going, they'll be adding at carbon number three, carbon number three, carbon number three, carbon number three, until the chain keeps on elongating. So we've talked about three bonds, the phosphoester, phosphodiester, and N glycosidic bond. Keep those bonds in mind. So already talked about the glycosidic bonds, the N glycosidic bonds, which join the bases, the paint of sugars. So we talked about them. These, we call it already talked about them. These are simply the structures and the nomenclature of DNA. So we have this, we have adenine here. We have the deox, so we have D, deoxy adenosine 5 monophosphate. The 5 shows that the phosphate group is attached at carbon number 5 on the pentose sugar. So these is simply the nomenclature of the nucleotide. So we have deox sometimes it can either be called deoxyadenylate or deoxyadenine 5 monophosphate. 
So these are the symbols. It can be used the DAMP, meaning the deoxy, the D meaning for deoxy AMP. The nucleoside involved is the deoxy adenosine. When you remove the phosphate group and you only remain the pentose sugar and the base, it becomes deoxy. Nomenclature for new, uh, ribonucleotides, it's pretty much the same as that of DNA. The only thing is that you remove the deoxy because that oxygen has not been removed. So if we have, for example, so we've done with adenine too much, we have this one, cytidylate. We have the base, we have the nitrogenous base we're looking at here is cyst, uh, cystidine. So when cystidine forms, a monophosphate becomes either cystidylate or cysteine 5 monophosphate. The 5, like I earlier mentioned, shows the positioning of the phosphate group on the pentose sugar. So that's basically the nomenclature of the ribonucleotides and the deoxy ribonucleotides. Before we go on the nucleotides and their biological importance, are there any questions? Any questions? Okay, so I'm guessing it's clear since I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, okay. So now we'll proceed to talk about the biological importance of these nucleotides because that's the, our main area. Okay, the nucleotides. So what? What are the nuclear? What's the function of these nucleotides? Why do we have these nucleotides? The next thing we're talking about. So the first nucleotide we'll be talking about a nucleotide containing adenosine, adenosine being the nitrogenous base present in those nucleotides. So the first thing we talk about is, excuse me, adenosine triphosphate, also known as ATP. So the function of ATP is to provide energy needed for muscle contraction, nerve impulse transmission, spermatozoa motility, and so many factors pretty much the energy of the cell, which gives its use as an energy form, ATP. The other function of ATP is in the methylation process. So it's required for active methionine formation. When you're trying to make methionine through methylation, ATP is required. It also plays a role in peptide and protein synthesis from the amino acids. ATP can be converted to ADP and AMP by simply removing one or two phosphate groups from the ATP. So these are some of the roles of ATP in our body. The next thing you can talk about is ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, which simply means that adenosine nucleotidinous base, a pentose sugar, and two phosphate groups, ADP. So this ADP plays a role in oxidative phosphorylation and photophosphorylation. So oxidative phosphorylation is a topic which you do later on, which shows how the cells in through the organelles, the mitochondria, uh, produce or create a generic energy, so to say. So that's the process of oxidative phosphorylation. It, its other role is to activate the enzyme glutamase dehydrogenase. You come across this enzyme in future lectures. The other thing you can talk about in the function of these nucle nucleotides, we have the AMP, the adenosine monophosphate. Number one is for enzyme activation, e.g. phosphorylase in muscle, which increases glycogen.
yeah that's on the gtp and it ends. then the next thing we can talk about are you uridine uridine nucleotides so these uridine nucleotides are conjugation detoxification of bilirubin sterols and many other things they equally take part in the biosynthesis of heparin so heparin is a very important molecule in our body it's normally used as an anticoagulant it's what prevents blood from clotting from forming clots in our body so uridine nucleotides are important in the preparation of heparin is that a question i'm getting sorry Is there, is there a question or someone trying to ask a question or it was a mistake sir. oh all right thank you then we can proceed sure okay we can proceed the next thing is the cystidine nucleotides these are simple nucleotides made up of cystidine as the nitrogenous base present in there so they can be either cmp cdp deoxy cdp and the derivatives of choline glycerol and glucose so mainly just is a simply nucleotide which contains cystidine as and as that nitrogenous base present there so they some of their functions include the cdp choline cdp cdp glycerol so now this take part in the biosynthesis of phospholipids of which these phospholipids are important in the formation of the cell membrane we have the CMP sialic acid, which takes part in the biosynthesis of salivary mucin, the, mu the mucus, so so we find in our saliva, the CMP sialic acid takes part in that biosynthesis of that particular mucin. The other one is the CM CAMP, the cyclic adenosine monophosphate. So this, like I mentioned earlier, it plays a number of roles in our body it's a very important biomolecule so the cmp it acts as a hormone action mediator so if you remember we're talking about a uh, cell the cell membrane how signals are moved in from the outside of the cell to the inside to the signal transduction and whatnot so for example when if you can remember there are those ligand uh channels for example when a hormone comes and binds to there there's those, those ligands send a secondary message into the cell, which leads to the formation of cyclic AMP, which relays that message which, which came from the ligand to the DNA to either increase transcription, hot it, or something of that sort. So the CMP acts as a secondary messenger in the cell. CM metabolism of glycogen, it inhibits cholesterol biosynthesis. It moderates transcription and translation. It also regulates cell membrane permeability to sodium, water, calcium, and potassium. So this CMP is able to regulate how much potassium comes in or leaves sodium, so on and so forth. It also plays a role in cell differentiation, plays an important role in the regulation of insulin circulation. Sorry. So as you can see, this CMP has a number of functions. Yeah. The other cyclic nucleotide you can look about, look at is C G M P. So whenever you see a small letter C and G M P or any other things, like a small C simply means it's cyclic. So now this C G M P plays a role in protein phosphorylation when you're adding phosphate groups to protein. It acts as a vasodilator or in vasodilation to broaden the size of the blood vessels. It helps in neurotransmission and in retina light dark adaptation so that it helps in how the retina adapts to different conditions of light. Okay. okay. Now, we've talked about the biological importance. Any questions? 
before you progress to the clinical applications of these nucleotides, the clinical applications of the nucleotides. Okay, I'll take it there, no questions. So, uh, we took, now, the, the, we'll talk about the clinical applications. So now, we're looking at nucleotides. So the first nucleotide we're looking, about, looking at is CAMP. So number one, these nucleotides help in diagnosis of pseudohypoparathyroidism, PHP, through the, the increase in urinary CMP in PHP patients less than fourfold while that of normal patients with surgical idiopathic hypoparathyroidism is 200 folds after IV injection with bovine. So this, okay, how can I, let's see this now, how can I put this in simpler terms? So when you're diagnosing for this pseudo hypoparathyroidism, so when you notice that there's an increase in urinary CMP, automatically you know that in that patient you're diagnosing, they have this particular disease due to the increase in CMP. That's how you're able to detect CMP, uh, the PHP, the pseudo hypoparathyroidism, to the increased levels of urinary CMP. So, in other thyroid disorders, hypothyroidism ex exhibits low plasma concentration of CMP. So, when you come to plasma in other thyroid disorder, in a thyroid disorder, for example, so you can find that in the plasma there will be low CMP levels. When you find that the low CMP levels, that becomes an indication to the presence of hypothyroidism in the body. So they have also thyrotoxicosis. Yes, thyrotoxicosis. This is what happens when there's an increased plasma levels of CMP. So when you have low levels of plasma CMP, you can suggest or su suspect having hypothyroidism. When the levels are elevated on the other side, the suspect becomes the thyrotoxicosis. These are some of the applications of CAMP. In malignant diseases, the growth rate of malignant cells is reduced and normal foliage is reduced, is returned after addition of CAMP and its derivatives. So, <coughs> excuse me. In malignant diseases, mainly like, like cancer, for example, so they're normally treated by addition of CMP and its derivatives. These are some of the clinical applications of CAM. Uh, in the liver, for example. So in liver disease, for it to be able to differentiate extrahepatic obstructive jaundice and intrahepatic cholestasis, CAMP is a very important factor to use. So if an IV injection, so IV simply means intravenous. So if an intravenous injection of glucagon in patients with hectra, extrahepatic duct obstructive jaundice results in an increase in plasma level camp. So when you have someone who has the extrahepatic duct obstructive jaundice, when you inject them intravenously with glucagon, you notice an increase in plasma CAMP. That's how you're able to add, diagnose for the same extrahepatic duct obstructive jaundice. But when you have intrahepatic cholestasis or cirrhosis, there is no significant increase in plasma levels of. So that's how you can use CAMP to diagnose for different clinical manifestations in the body. So now we have things which are known as nucleoside analogs. So from the term nucleoside analog, simply it tells that it resembles a nucleoside, but it is not a nucleoside. <clears throat> so these um, nucleoside analogs, they resemble naturally, occur occur naturally occurring nucleosides, but have, a stru have structure modification. So they resemble the nucleotides, nucleosides, but are not nucleosides. So most of these nucleoside analogs are used in anti-tumoral and antiviral comp compounds in therapy of human in HIV, HPV, H hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus, cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex, 
virus and so many viral infections so these nucleoside analogs help in the, tr the treatment of these diseases yeah those are some of the functions so these uh, okay where was i okay now have these nucleoside analogs so now the incorporation into the viral nucleic acid leads to disruption of their biological process now interaction with vital enzymes like humans viral polymerases dna methyltransferases and so many other enzymes have in also have cytotoxic immunosuppressive anti-cancer properties so these nucleoside analogs mainly are used as therapeutics they are used to treat viral infection by interfering by interacting with enzymes this enzyme which lead to helping the body better fight these particular viruses these are the nucleoside analogs so this diagram here just simply shows a mode of action of these nucleoside analogs so for example we have on a there we have a viral infection and b we have cancerous neoplasia so this nucleoside analog will be sent into the body after sent into the body they will be phosphorylated by addition of phosphate, phosphate groups to them as you can see here we have a nucleoside analog here it enters the cell gets phosphorylated with the addition of three phosphate groups now the role of the nucleoside analog is to target dna or rna polymerases and inhibit them so remember dna virus is supposed to replicate so when the drug the nucleoside analog comes and targets those polymerases it prevents the replication or the translation and the whole process of this to inhibition and hence helping in the treating of that particular cases by chain termination so <clears throat> when this nucleoside analog enters the body now those with, with uh reverse transcriptases which are found in the viral infection for example of hiv so now when this nucleoside analog targets those it leads to chain termination which stops the, gr the growing of that viral dna the other function of this nucleoside analog is it attacks the nucleoside converting enzyme so in it attacking the nucleoside converting enzyme you find that it leads to mut mutagenesis it kills the mutagens present in that particular body so these are just some of the modes of actions of these therapeutic nucleoside analogs So all this is just showing us the structure of HIV genome. This is just the HIV genome and its structure. So this is just there for you, mainly to appreciate the, the genome structure. So now, when you look at this here, we have this TAT, REV, GAG, Paul, and so many. These are all present in the hiv genome and its structure this is just simply a diagram helping us to appreciate the hiv genome and its structure <clears throat> excuse me so now nucleoside analogs are helpful in the treating of hiv so they have a highly an active antiretrotherapy heart they're very active in uh, hiv therapy drugs these include the nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, non nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, protease inhibitors, integrase inhibitor. So, when you look at the HIV life cycle, how HIV enters the body and incorporates itself to be part of your DNA, the enzymes, uh, the protease, the integrase, these the important enzymes which are needed for uh, DNA to replicate itself and be part of the human genome. 
Now these nucleoside analogs come to inhibit the acti activation of those protease and integrase enzymes, thereby slowing down the action of the HIV virus. That, those are some, some of the functions of these nucleoside analogs. This diagram here is just simply showing us the life cycle of the HIV virus. This is from 2021. This is showing us the life cycle of the HIV virus from the time it enters your cell to the time it matures, it splits up, and so many, so on and so forth. So I'm sure you'll be able to read this once the lecture is, or once the session is done, that I'll be able to send the notes to your group and be able to go through and clearly understand the HIV virus. So this is how the HIV virus life cycle looks like. Uh, so for the nucleoside analogs, not all nucleoside analogs are approved for therapeutics. So the ones which are approved, we have the first one, which is the Zudovudin, ZDV, and the Azido, Zymidine. We have the Tenofio, the Lamivudin, all these is just a list of the nucleoside analogs that are approved to be used in the treatment of HIV. These are just some of the, the structures of those nucleoside analogs. As you can see, they resemble nucleoside, but they are not nucleosides. So this is pretty much a summary. We looked at what nucleic acids are. We talked about the difference between nucleosides and nucleotides. We talked about the composition of nucleotides and described each component, the biological role, clinical application of AMP, and what these nucleoside, what are nucleoside analogs and what they are used for. So this you can read on your own for your further understanding. You can read more about the nucleoside analogs used in therapeutic in cancer. Read on HIV biochemistry. <clears throat> read on the list of approved drugs, the nucleoside, nucleotide analogs, mutation. So when I send the notes, I'm sure you'll be able to. So please make sure you do read and find time to research and go through on these particular topics. Because when, whenever your lecturers give you something, I read through, self-study, they will bring it. It either will come in the exam or a test, but for sure it will come. And I remember this were the notes we were using last year. And these are the things that took us us to read about. And most of these things did appear in our test one, especially when they ask you about these uh, HIV analogs, the the, the voodoo, the so on and so forth. Most of these, I'm sure you'll be able to find them. So that's the end of uh, our session.